for the next part of our talk, instead of our um, kind of slide presentation that we often do, we're going to shake things up a little bit, uh, which I'm really very excited about. Um, so we're going to we're going to do a discussion format. And our guest is Emily Monison, and she's the author of Natural Defense, Unnatural Selection and Evolution in a Toxic World. Um, and now her new book is called Blight. Um, and it was just released in the last week or two weeks. So you should absolutely look for it. You've probably, um, you know, got a very positive review in the New York Times. And she was interviewed by Terry Gross on Fresh Air, Dream. Uh, so a lot of, a lot of cool stuff going on. Um, but anyway, so Emily was trained as a toxicologist. And I have a lot of questions about that. It was very interesting. But she's now a science writer and also an adjunct faculty member at UMass Amherst, and she lives in Montague, Massachusetts. So um, I guess maybe to start out, um, Emily, if you want to, you know, hop on and you could just tell us, tell us a little bit about how you came to write this book, because, um, you know, it's definitely, it's definitely science writing, but how did fungi, how did fungi catch your eye? <laughs> Yeah, well, so first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for inviting me to this. This has been awesome. I want to join, if I, if I lived there, I think I'd join your group because this, I, I'm just amazed. And um, and I love the Beatrix Potter. I mean, I just, I loved that presentation. And it did make me think of, because uh, just before we got here, we were talking about Flora Patterson and she was actually working at that time and you know we can talk about her later, unless you guys all know about her because you probably do. But if you don't, no, we don't. We can talk about her. I don't think so. We'd love to hear about her. Yeah, because that was a fascinating story, um, and Megan knows about her, so we can talk about that. But so I'll just we can get back to that. Um, that's tough yes, act to follow. So I'm kind of glad I'm not doing a presentation. Um, and I have to say that I am not a mycologist. I don't know, I couldn't even join the mycological whatever because I don't even know mushrooms. I love seeing them. I hike a lot and I just love taking pictures of them and looking at all the different colors. And I sometimes wonder about it, but I just never got to the point of actually looking up what they are. <laughs> so maybe I'll get there. Um, you should join iNaturalist. Uh, we, you know, your I, observations would be great to have on there. Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking. I'm thinking about at least looking at your iNaturalist, you know, your iNaturalist uh, site because, yeah, I do. I, I'm always amazed at the colors that uh, I see. So. And the Boston I, Mycological Club is a great, great club you have up in Massachusetts. So you oh, yeah. Can, okay. Yeah, definitely tell you about that, but. Yeah, now tell us about, yeah, so tell okay. us about. So, um, and the, what actually, I think one of the first things that kind of got me thinking about fungus um, was not really a fungus, it was fungus-like. It was the my, Phytophthora infestans uh, epidemic that, or pan, you know, that kind of came up the East Coast in the, um, when was it? It was like the early 2000s. I don't know, I'm guessing you're probably all aware of how, when and how that happened, but it was kind of the first year that I had some really great tomatoes growing. And uh, they just, you know, overnight they were gone. And so then we had a local CSA farm, and I talked, and he, they were well known for their heirloom tomatoes. They grow all different kinds of tomatoes and win awards. And he got wiped out. So I talked to him and I thought I'd write a story about that. So that's sort of what first made me aware of the destructive power of something that's fungus like. And then when I realized, you know, it's the same kind of organism as the potato blight, um, you know, I just kind of, and then to learn how that probably spread, um, you know, I don't know how aware people are of when that happened and what happened, but, you know, in the early, so stop me. And no, I think actually, anyone, it, it you would, know. I, I doubt people are, and I think also, if you, if you want to say a little bit, just to clarify that it's like a water mold, and it's kind of a funky yes. organism, because I think folks might not know that we have like a oh. really I mean, I know Megan Robert, <laughs> I, I'm not sure everybody else does. So. Okay. Well, so yeah, so it's a water, it's Phytophthora infestans, it's water mold. And I don't know how to say, oh, oh my CD, oh, oh, my CD. How do you say it? Oh, 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 oh. I mean, I, we, I, we I usually say, say oh, like, <laughs> oh, 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 my CD. So, yeah. yes, <laughs> that's what it is. And um, so it's, it's only fungus-like, it's more related to plants. <laughs> 
and then well, to you know, fungi or animals like unlike fungi. So it's different, but um, it it came off the East Coast, and one of the interesting story, and it and it hasn't gone away since then. So we get we get it every few years. There's a pretty bad outbreak, and at the time when I was trying to write a story about it, I spoke to a scientist from Cornell who was trying to track the origin of it. And it turns out that it was probably spread by a big box store. And Megan, stop me if this is wrong. Um, Bill Fry, I don't know if you know him from Cornell, had done some studies. And what they did was they tracked it back and they thought it was the distribution of starter tomato plants up the East Coast that were probably contaminated. And so that, that in itself, just thinking about that, about how you could spread a disease like that was something new to me. Um, this was back in the early 2000s. And so then around that time, there was another group that wrote this paper in, um, I think it was in Nature, just about different uh, fungal pandemics and epidemics across species. And they were really trying to raise awareness about fungi uh, generally. And it was a group of scientists across disciplines from medical to plants to wildlife, agricultural. And that's pretty unusual to see that kind of a paper with that, you know, consortia of so many different disciplines writing about the same kind of thing together. And so at that time I thought I'd write a book and then I thought that was too depressing so I didn't do it. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, back in, I think it was 2014, I can't remember when Candida auris, which is a yeast infection that infects humans, um, started, uh, came into the sort of um, CDC's awareness that this is uh, an emergent fungal pathogen uh, was something new. And so it gained a lot of um, attention. And so that's when I thought, okay, maybe now I should get together and write, try this book again. And the interesting thing is, I think if I had written this book back when I first wanted to write it, it would have just been like all the other books I wrote, <laughs> just been published and really not gone anywhere. Um, but this year there was, you know, so I started to write it before the pandemic. Um, but not only was there the viral pandemic, but there was the last of us, which has like done more for fungal pathogens, I think, than like the World Health Organization can do for human fungal pathogens to raise awareness. So that that's sort of the, um, you know, the origin of like how I started to write it and what happened. Well, that's really, that's very cool. And yeah, I think we've all kind of had the sense that fun, uh, fungi are having a moment and you know the it feels like it is coming from a lot of different directions, but I think this is a, a very interesting one. Um, you know, when I first saw um, when I first saw your book and read about the title, I you know we love fungi, and so I was like, oh, is this going to be you know like a mycophobic book that's going to you know scare people about fungi? That is not at all. I just want to say for. <laughs> for everybody that was not at all the vibe that that I got from it and I think certainly you know you conveyed the power and some of the ways that fungi are unique in terms of being pathogens in terms of what they can do but like to me they were not the villains of the book I mean I don't think that there I don't think there really was a villain but if there was a problematic character it was kind of like humanity yeah. um and and so um, you know, I think it, a lot of it was like our activities and, and you know, kind of how are how are our activities um, putting fungi in places that they, you know, maybe yeah. shouldn't be. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, just to take it way back to something very basic, which I really thought was neat to read about and, and may give us a, a background for talking about some of the human pathogens um, that you discuss. Can you can you just explain the idea or this theory about the fungal filter and, oh, and mammals, because that was really, I thought that was so cool. And I don't know if other people have heard of that, but I had never heard of that before. I thought it was really neat. Yeah, so just to back up why anyone would even think about the fungal filter is that, you know, humans really are not that susceptible to fungal pathogens. Uh, and then there's a few reasons. One of them is that we have a pretty robust immune response, but one of the other major reasons is just that, our warm temperatures and that most fungi just don't like growing at the temp at our body temperatures. And so there's a scientist, Arturo Casadevall, who um, I think you probably, if you, you know, there's lots of, he's in the news a lot about um, talking about climate change and the rise of 
Candida auris, which is that yeast that I talked about, which they think is one of the first um, sort of emergent fungal pathogens uh, in part because of climate change, if that's what happened. Nobody will really know, but that's the hypothesis. And so what he's uh, written about is that he had this idea that um, he calls it the fungal filter. And it's that when the, you know, 65 million years ago, when the asteroid hit the planet and everything got white, or a lot of things got wiped out, um, he asks, why did mammals emerge as sort of a dominant species rather than reptiles and amphibians? So, because there are plenty of them and, you know, what, what gave us the edge? And so his thinking is that, you know, at that time when that hit, there was lots of dead stuff. Um, fungi were having a field day, and I guess that's in the fossil record. There's lots of fungal spores, and so they can. So that his idea is that maybe the fungi could also infect the reptiles and amphibians, but the mammals were pretty safe, and so they had a little edge over these pathogen potential pathogens. And so that's sort of the idea of the fungal filter was that the mammals were able to sort of ex you know dominate because they weren't getting sick from fungi. Well, so I love that because it's an origin story for humanity that, you know, yeah. gives kind of credit in a way. So it's yeah. like they were there before us and they allowed us to <laughs> join the party. <laughs> yeah. So, and, you know, and so then with the Candida auris, it's just that, you know, so the question is, did, you know, because of the climate, warming climate, it's an environmental fungus. It's out there and, you know, uh, they're trying to figure out where it lives naturally in the environment. But, you know, as the climate temperature warms and the environment warms, um, some of those fungi are going to evolve to be able to tolerate a few degrees warmer. And so, well, there are two things that interested me about the Candida auris. The first one was that it was first found in some people's ears, which yeah. I thought you pointed out, which I thought I had been thinking too is this because ears are a little cooler um so that was pretty interesting ear infections and then the other thing um that i was really interested and in, maybe you can speak to this a little bit um in contrast with uh some of the viral pandemic or viral epidemics and our most recent viral pandemic where there was like one clear source i was very interested to read that there were four separate clades yeah. of uh, uh, or groups of this mm -hmm. candida auris that all seemingly independently um, kind of developed this resistance. So can you say a little bit about that and like what that makes you think and what that makes people think about yeah. the climate side of things, like why, how that might implicate climate change? Yeah, so this, so what happened was, you know, like um, Annie said, we all kind of, we all, we all kind of watched the, uh, the COVID-19 virus evolve in real time, right? Everybody would look, oh, there's a new one came from this strain and here's what it looks like now and here's what it looks like now. So we just watched different strains of COVID-19 evolve from what was probably the original strain. What happened with Candida auris is that it seems to have emerged within you know, a year or two um, around the globe in different places. And it they can't trace it back to one original um, Candida auris strain. So it looks like at the same time, several different strains just emerged. And so I think there's a, um, four or five different clades or, or groups of um, Candida auris, which is why they think that, you know, why all of a sudden would it just start popping up everywhere? And so one of the, you know, they, they thought maybe it's just that they hadn't been looking for it before, because that sometimes happens. If you're not looking for it, you don't know it's there, or if you misdiagnose it, um, but they kind of could dismiss that after they started doing some genetics and looking at backlogs of samples that they had. And so it really looks like these emerged um, all together around the same time. And also they emerged with different, um, many of them, one of the problems with Canada auris is that um, it's a lot of those different strains are uh, antifungal resistant, which is also kind of weird. Um, for something to just emerge and be resistant to the antifungals that we have, uh, which also makes it a more dangerous in, uh, infection uh, because it's hard to cure. Some of them are almost completely antifungal resistant. And when a, fun when a fungus like that um, infects people and it becomes goes systemic, 
So if it's on your skin and it's just colonizing you, it's not such a problem. But if it becomes a systemic, goes systemic, then the mortality rate could be something as high as like, I think it's one in three um, patients can die from it. it. And those that are most susceptible to it, I have to say, are usually uh, immunocompromised because um, our immune system does a pretty good job. So, yeah. Well, so that's, yeah, that's very, you know, interesting and, and scary stuff for sure. Um, one thing that it brings up is, and I wondered if you could tell us this, like, why is it so hard to, to treat fungal infections when they do kind of take uh, take root? Like, it, se it seems like it's much more difficult to find a medication to treat a fungal pathogen than like a bacteria or virus or? Yeah, so not a mycologist and I'm not a physician. <laughs> Are you a physician? Yeah. <laughs> so you might be able to help on this question too. But my <laughs> understanding is, first of all, there aren't a whole lot of different antifungal, there aren't a lot of different classes of antifungal medications. And so a different, cl each class, so when you have antibacterials, there's usually a target on the bacteria. There's something that those medications are targeting. And so the more different targets you have, the more different opportunities you have to kill that bacteria. So there's many different classes of antibacterials. The same is not true for fungus. There's only, I think, like three, um, major classes for treating systemic fungal infections. And my understanding is one of the reasons for that is because fungi are eukaryotes and we're eukaryotes. And so our cells and fungal cells are very similar. Uh, the more similar your cells are, it's harder to have a target that's not going to kill your cells too. So, which is different from bacteria. You can find targets that are very different from our cells. So yes, I love this point because I like, I want to bring it back to fungi you know, being the best. And basically they're just like us, like their cells, as you're saying, are more like us than, than they are like plants, you know, evolutionarily they're, we, you know, they're more closely connected to animals. And so like, as you're saying, it, it totally makes sense that like, if you're going to target parts of them, you're, tar you're going to target us. And one of the most, like one of the things that, you know, these like catchphrases stick in your mind and you know, one thing I remember is like amphotericin B, which is like one of these, you know, met, it's a really hardcore. So we've all, the azoles, like you've probably, a lot of people here have probably taken fluconazole, you know, if you've ever gotten any kind of yeast infection, um, you know, it's a pretty common thing that people will take diflucan is like with the, uh, the fancy drug name for it. But anyway, um, those are like probably more low key and common, but this amphotericin B is like an infusion and it's like this really intense drug. And, you know, I, Emily, you wrote about this in your book that, you know, it can have really severe toxicity in part because of the similarities that we have to fungi. So it targets something that's similar to cholesterol, I, I guess. And is that, is that about so. right? I can't, I can't yeah. remember the specifics, but I think that's yeah. right. Or well, I, target their or gosterol, which I think is a similar yes. pathway to our cholesterol. So yes, yes, yeah, exactly. So anyway, but it can lead to a lot of kidney damage. So yeah, that that was very interesting. We have a question in the chat from Adonia, which I think is a great question. Are there any commensal fu fungi, and so like any do we have good relationships with any fungi? I guess <laughs> it's a question. Yeah. So one of the things that I did, which I didn't write about, was I you know, wanted to, so I started the book off saying, how, you know, acknowledging that most fungi are, uh, you know, if not beneficial, then they're just there. They're not going to cause a problem uh, in the environment and in our bodies. And so I had my um, fungal, my microbiome uh, analyzed um, by this guy, Mahmoud Ganoun, who does, he's a, he's a, he has cool. a business that that's what he does. So I sent a little soul sample off. <laughs> <laughs> cool. <laughs> and, he, and he did that. And so, um, you know, and it, 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 what he showed, what he looks at is the different classes. Um, and it turns out I had way too much yeast, which I'm guessing probably a lot of people do, but um, compared to, I can't remember the other, um, the other genuses that were there, but, but anyway, so, you know, I had too much of one thing and not enough of other commensals. And so, yeah, there are definitely ones that are thought and you know the whole microbiome thing whether you're talking bacteria fungi protozoa whatever 
I think it's all really new. So I don't know that anybody really knows what's really good and what's just hanging out there and what's bad, you know, they've known probably more about the bad things, but in terms of beneficial and how beneficial, I think that's something that's being worked on, you know, trying to, scientists trying to figure that out now. And I would say probably the same for fungus. They could just say that, you, you know, an overgrowth of yeast isn't good, which probably lots of people have experienced. Um, but, you know, as far as which ones are good, I think there's some idea, but, you know, I, I can't offhand. I think like one that might be good is, might be Saccharomyces boulardii, I, but I don't yeah, know like be. how, I don't know how terrific the evidence is for it, but I, I think um, like the cultural yogurt and then like a floor store yeah. over the counter medication, I, I think those are, so people will take those kind of similarly. And I like, I'm not speaking to their efficacy at all, but I just, I, people will take those in a similar way that they might take lactobacillus or, you know, some of the other things to help their gut flora. Um, that's the yeah. one, I don't know, Megan, do any others come, come to your mind that good, good guys or? And particularly in humans? Yeah, well, or not. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I don't really know a lot about human, but I mean, there are a lot of fungi that seem to have um, positive effects as endophytes in a lot of different trees and other plants. Yeah. Yeah, and the guy that did the gut microbiome, of course, also sells <laughs> probiotics, so, you know, um, but he is a, he's pretty well respected in his world of human yeast fungal stuff. So I tend to think he's pretty good, but yeah. So that's what I know of. The well, that's really cool. Fungal. Just the idea that that exists is like really interesting and, and neat. Like, I think, yeah, I would love to read an article about that. Um, well, you have a comment or a question in the chat. Let me see, just try to scroll. So Jamie said um, they had the chance to listen to the audiobook shortly after Sorry, it's hard for me to see everything in one screen shortly after it was released and um, and loved it. <laughs> they loved it and um, I, and was really curious about the chapter on chestnut trees and the role of DNA sequencing um, in identifying the trees native to China that had resistance and um, Jamie, you would love to hear your thoughts on the role of DNA sequencing and potential genetic engineering. Um, sorry, to it's just like I'm having some trouble. So you might be able to see this better than me. I, so it seems like there's a few different points here. So one is, I, I think what you're asking is them uh, the genetic sequencing. So of the chestnut tree which changed how they thought about breeding in resistance to the chestnuts, if, if I'm understanding your question correctly. Um, and then, so the, the story of the, should I just back up and just say this quickly, the story of the- Yeah, why don't we that, start with the, I, actually, because I really wanted to talk about the chestnuts too. I mean, like <laughs> okay. every once in a while, pictures will circulate online um, in some of the groups that we're in of like chestnut trees. And they're just the size of like 10 people. I mean, it just like breaks my heart to never have been able to see that. And I think it would be really neat to hear about that story and also about what's been done um, to try to combat it. Yeah, so the story of the chestnut is that it, it actually begins in the Bronx. So um, where, uh, I don't have to go back to that whole origin story, but basically back in the around 1904 was when one of the um, uh, foresters, the guy who kept the grounds for the Bronx Zoo noticed that he, he took care of all the trees in the zoo. They were very important to the, the, um, the, the zoo um, association, the trees, because that was something they couldn't replace. Like you just said, those huge chestnuts. So you can imagine those huge chestnuts in New York City, um, other kinds of old growth trees that were preserved in the zoo. And so they, you know, they were really important. So they hired a guy um, and I'm blanking on his name. I think it's Herman Merkel, but I don't remember. Um, there's a lot of names. And so anyway, he, he noticed that the chestnuts weren't doing so well in one year. And so he thought maybe it was just a temporary thing. He actually took a sample. Um, I think it was the second year when it looked like more chestnuts were dying. Um, he took a sample, he sent it to our national mycologist. Well, she wasn't the national mycologist then, she was the mycologist, which was Flora Patterson. 
uh, which is, I think, the first, one of the first times she comes up in the book. She's she's like there. She she pops. This is a woman who was worked for the USDA. I think she was hired around 1900, maybe a little bit before, uh, and she was a mycologist, and that was her job. And she, it, actually, they hired two. One dropped out pretty quickly. A guy didn't stick around, but she did, and she worked for USDA for 30 years. And I have to say that I I think I wrote, and I hope it's accurate that. Like Megan can trace her position back to Flora Patterson, and it's almost all been all female throughout that whole time, which is just that's just that's a fascinating so cool. story right there. Just so um, people know, and because we're record, you know, we'll record this. We're talking about our scientific advisor to our club, Megan Romberg, who's a mycologist at the USDA and had this like really cool lineage. So <laughs> the evolution of Megan Romberg. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but the story was really interesting of Flora Patterson, and I was a little bummed that she kind of blew it with the chestnuts. That was too yeah. bad. <laughs> well, she might have misdiagnosed <laughs> the chestnut. She uh, identified as some kind of fungus, which she said uh, was kind of common, but it was weird because it never usually infects chestnuts. So she did know that. Uh, and it, so then um, a colleague uh, um, down the street at the botanical gardens eventually did identify uh, the fungus that infected chestnut. A few years later, the origin of that fungus was found to be China after the, you know, the people that the, the um, USDA would send people out to do lots of exploration and bring trees and um, all sorts of plants back to the US. And so they had one that was uh, Frank Meyer that was going out, I think it was him, I can't remember, was going out to China and they said, hey, can you look for this fungus and see if you can find it in the chestnut trees? And, China because they had some uh, inkling that it was probably uh, Japanese or Chinese chestnut trees that had maybe brought the fungus to the US and on imported trees because they were importing lots of those for ornamental and for growing. And so he did find that in China. So that's where they knew and, and it was growing in the, in the trees that it was infecting weren't dying like our trees were. So it wasn't wiping out the trees. They had kind of, you know, co-evolved together. So that is sort of the origin story of understanding that the fungus that kill, was killing off the American chestnuts, which within 30 years basically wiped out most of our chestnut trees. But it was um, incredible how fast that happened. Yes. I mean, it I, yeah. it blew my mind. You said the the zoo story I thought was a really cool microcosm because it was this like isolated area. And you said in your book, you said like, well, on one year he noticed yeah. it and the next year, every single tree yeah. had, I mean, what a, yeah. heartbreak yeah yeah so it, it was fast um i had some number about how many miles a year it traveled i mean but it, it traveled very quickly and partly maybe because there were so many chestnut trees so it's what you know could easily travel from what you know every time setting out spores there were lots of trees to infect so the trees were wiped out um within i can't remember 30 40 years american chestnuts were wiped out they did know that they that the that the um fungus or that the Chinese chestnut trees seem to have tolerate the fungus. And so uh, in the, I can't remember the years here, but shortly after the trees were wiped out, some scientists decided that maybe they could breed resistant chestnut trees. And so the idea was that they would take Chinese chestnut trees, breed them with the American chestnut trees, and then sort of, you know, try to make some kind of hybrid that was resistant. Um, and so they were trying to do this. It wasn't really all that successful. Then in the 1980s, uh, another scientist came along and he thought that maybe if he had this really um, kind of plant, he was an um, agricultural scientist, so he knew how to breed in the genes that you want and breed out the other characteristics that you don't want by back cross breeding, breeding a plant back to you know it's the origin and trying to breed out all the genes that you don't want. And so he came up with the idea of maybe I could take the you know genes from the chestnut, capture the resistance genes, and do a lot of back crossbreeding with American chestnuts, and then have a tree that's almost all American chestnut genes, but we've just captured the Chinese chestnut genes. And at the time, he thought that the genes for resistance to the fungus that there were just uh, like I don't know two or three genes, and so it wouldn't be that difficult to be able to breed in just a couple of genes. And so he had this whole 30 year plan. It was a 30 year breeding plan. And at the end of that 30 years, the idea would be that there would be a chestnut tree that is an almost all American chestnut tree characteristics, 
but resistant, highly resistant to chestnut blight. And the organization that took over the breeding of those trees is called the American Chestnut Foundation. And so they've had this 30 year breeding program. What happened um, fairly recently is that the end of that program actually would have been like within the year or two, um, just around now is when the kind of end of the program should be and they would get to the generation that should be the resistant, mostly American chestnut tree. What they found is that the trees were not, didn't have the characteristics that they wanted. They weren't as fully um, looking like the American chestnut tree. And also they weren't as resistant as they would have liked at the end of this 30 years of dedication, hundreds of volunteers, probably thousands, um, a lot of science and, and money. And so what they did have though is a recent sequence of the American chestnut, uh, I think of the Chinese chestnut tree, is that right? Yes, sequencing of the Chinese chestnut tree. And what they found is that it's not just a few genes, it's many genes, they're spread across different chromosomes. It would be impossible to have captured the resistance genes through a breeding program and have, you know, be able to breed out the characteristics uh, you know, they would have been linked to all sorts of other characteristics of the Chinese chestnut tree. So it just couldn't be done. Uh, so at the, around the same time in the 80s, late 80s, another group uh, run, led by William Powell um, uh, up in Syracuse, he was interested in using genetic engineering. That was kind of new then. Um, we, the, you know, Monsanto hadn't started doing its Roundup Ready corn at the time. There was some hope that genetic engineering could actually be a good thing. Um, back when they started it, would, it could be used to actually reduce the amount of herbicides and pesticides that were needed. So it wasn't looked at as, as such a uh, controversial thing as it is now. Uh, and so what he thought was, well, maybe I can use this to breed in resistance to, uh, to the fungus um, if I can find the right gene to breed into the American chestnut tree. Um, and there was a gene available, which is because um, it's a long story, so I won't go into it unless anyone cares, but well, well, so what the fungus does to get into the tree is it releases an enzyme. Um, and so in Europe, there was also um, chestnut blight and it was impacting their chestnut trees, but those trees weren't dying like the American chestnuts were. And what they found was that the fungus itself was hypovirulent, like it couldn't cause the, it just wasn't as virulent as it was here. And the reason why was that it was infected with a virus. Um, and so the virus made the, you know, blocked something in the fungus and what it was doing, I think, I don't take this for, or Megan can jump in if I get it wrong, um, was that it wasn't producing this um, oxalase. Um, which is the enzyme that help break yeah. in, you know, helps the fungus break into the plant that it's going to infect. And so the uh, Cryphonectria parasitica would produce this and it would break into the American chestnut. But in Europe, that wasn't happening. So the, the um, kind of light bulb moment was that if he could take a, you know, there are some plants that are resistant to fungal infections because they have a gene that can break down that um, uh, oxid, uh, oxalic acid, I think. Oxalic acid, yes. So they have a, an oxidase that can break it down. And so if he could capture that oxidase gene called oxo and implant that gene from some plant that is producing it into the tree, they could produce American chestnut trees that can also break down and be resistant, break down the oxalic acid. and protect themselves. So that's the story. And so what he did was, I think it was a wheat gene. So wheat, some wheat has the oxo gene. He took the oxo gene and he transplanted it into the American chestnut. And um, that has been, it was a very, you know, eventually took many years. Again, this is, you know, he started in the late eighties and just, uh, I think it was like the, around 2019 or something. He finally had the trees and had done all the testing necessary to try to get um, approval for doing this and releasing the trees into the wild. So he had to, you know, do all the EPA testing, FDA testing, um, oh, there's a bunch more, a lot of different uh, USDA maybe, I can't remember, but 
you know, there's a lot of permitting and testing to show that these wouldn't cause a problem if released into the environment. So that's that's the whole story, I think, unless there's some other question about that. But no, it's an amazing story. I mean, and they used like CRISPR, I guess, to the technology to do the gene. Is that right? I think. Uh, I'm not sure if he used CRISPR or more traditional breeding. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think this predated CRISPR. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. yeah, maybe that was from something else. Banana on. used CRISPR. Um, oh, the banana. Bananas. Yeah, maybe you could talk about. Well, actually, you know what? Before you say that, let me just ask a general question that will relate to the bananas, because I think the, the theme that I that I noticed in reading the book is like we kind of cause these problems. So I and I think it's fair to say that, like, we probably cause this chestnut problem, you know, by by bringing in the um, the the yeah. fungus from somewhere it wasn't supposed to be, you know, to somewhere that was really vulnerable. And, you know, similarly, we'll talk about the bananas, I hope. So anyway, we create these problems that then threaten things that are like really uh, important to us. But it's interesting to me that it, it, I think you talk in your book sort of about the approach we seem to take, which is like, let's fix this problem by like, you know, trying to like modify the gene and make a super kind of organism that can survive. Um, and, and, you even said at one point that in some situations, this kind of solution may actually create another problem because it, it we're like creating another kind of monoculture and who knows if it will be susceptible to some other, you know, it, it's, yeah. it's going to be resistant to this, but it'll be susceptible to something else. And when we're very focused on kind of engineering a single species, like, is that you know, it's very appealing that you're being kind of intentional, but is it misguided in some way? So maybe, Maybe you could talk a little bit about kind of what happened with bananas, what's happening with bananas now, and if, and if you could just talk a little bit about like human reactions to to these um, kind of fungi insults and and how are we getting it wrong? Are we getting it right? You know, what do you think? Yeah. So first of all, I just someone popped up on chat that there's a there's a phytophthora that's infecting chestnuts, and that's. Yeah, that's true, and that's a problem. Um, uh, and just to, to you know, to, when you mentioned, are you creating another problem by, you know, if you do resistance to just one thing, to think about, because um, I've thought about this with chestnut, I'm like, well, so, but that, think about the um, mechanism of resistance and whether that can be overcome or not by a fungus. So in the case of the chestnut, um, you know, it's, it's, it probably, it would, I think it would probably be hard for um, the cryphonectria to overcome that kind of a defense, right? Because you're cutting it, cutting it off its main way of getting in. You're not just targeting one. Um, so, so there's that versus the kind of thing where um, the, when they're breeding in bananas, trying to find um, resistant, you know, there are different kinds of resistances, I guess that's what I'm saying. And if you're, um, I wrote about, this going a little bit back into something different, but in pine trees, I wrote about that they're trying to breed in resistance to a different kind of fungus, pine blister rust. And there are concerns there that if you just are breeding in one, you know, one kind of, one gene, or two genes, it's very likely that the pine blister rust is gonna be able to evolve to um, overcome those resistances. So I think you have to think about the kind, how the, what the mechanism of resistance is and whether or not the fungus can overcome it. Cause it, it's not always a given that that's gonna happen. Just like with antibiotics, you know, we pretty much know that there's, you know, the bacteria, fungi are probably going to be able to overcome the resistance depending on the mechanism, right? And so anyway, the bananas is um, a problem because uh, unlike the, in the other differences, chestnuts aren't growing as a monoculture. They're in a forest. If they go, if they, if they're putting back, you know, chestnuts, when they replace them, they will be in a, um, polyculture like forest and try to make them more like an ecosystem. So the bananas are grown as a huge monocrop. 
And so that is a problem. Um, there was a banana fungus that wiped out one species, one kind of strain of banana back in the 50s and 60s. And then all they did was replace it with another resistant kind of banana. And now there's a different fungus that's related to the first fungus. It's now wiping out the bananas that we all eat, which, is, which are the Cavendish bananas. And so bananas are very hard to breed because we all know there aren't seeds. <laughs> um, so how do you breed, uh, you know, a, a plant that, you know, make hybrids or, you know, pick, choose different kinds of strains when you don't have seeds? It's really hard. Um, they can do it, uh, but it's, it takes a huge amount of bananas <laughs> to try to um, just uh, more traditionally breed resistance into banana. So genetic I love engineering. You wrote about tiny little, like they, 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 like having clusters of banana cells and then having little tiny bananas develop on these kind of cultures. Like it was really yeah. interesting, like how they- Yeah, they clone them. I mean, that's yeah. so bananas are cloned and <laughs> they either take, you know, they'll either do cell, uh, you know, petri dish clones, but they have these little petri dish banana clonelets and then they plant those or they take the stalks and they just, you know, take a stalk and plant it. So, or take from the stalk and plant it. So they are really clones and there's no genetic diversity there, which is one of the problems with the, you know, a monoculture like bananas where there's just absolutely no genetic diversity. And so some fungus comes along that, so there is one guy who is, a, that I know of that's um, attempting to do, uh, that I emailed with that's attempting to do um, a genetic engineer fix to the current fungus problem. And he did, uh, he did a traditional GM um, strain that is resistant to the fungus, but that's been sort of put on hold because of pushback. Um, there's, you know, it's that controversial. It's very difficult to think that these can, things can get um, GM like genetically modified. Is that's what genetically you're modified, modified, right? So yeah. he did one that was more traditionally genetically modified, and then more recently, when CRISPR came along and he could do some gene editing. Um, He's and I, you know, I can't speak too much of this because I can't, I can't remember everything I wrote and talked to these details. Um, so, it's I, <laughs> uh, but what he did do was he was able to turn on, I think, resistance genes or turn off the susceptibility genes. I can't remember which way it goes, but that, but doing that meant that he didn't have to transfer any kind of foreign genes, even if he's just transferring other banana genes. Um, he didn't have to transfer anything. So that is gene editing, just turning on and off of genes. And by doing that, he's hoping that that will be able to get through without all of the necessary extra testing for GM and also not raise as much concerns because he's not actually modifying, you know, genetically modifying. I guess he is, but he's just turning on and off the genes that exist. So that's where he's at now. With your description of the banana, um, like how the bananas are grown, I mean, it was incredible. Like the the care that yeah. goes into having a perfect banana show up at you know your grocery store. I mean, it, I I guess it should have been obvious to me that you know you get these like not bruised perfect things, but I mean. Can you just say a little bit about like what it looks like on a plant? Because that blew my mind. It was such an amazing description. It was so. First of all, we were really fortunate to be able to go to a banana plantation because that used to be. So I did. So I proposed this book before COVID, and I thought I was going to go everywhere. I thought I was going to go get to see Megan and go to the like fungal archives and see cool stuff and look at what Flora Patterson put aside. But that, none of that happened. But right before. Um, everything shut down. I did get in a trip to Costa Rica. And so we went to this place called Earth University. So it's a teaching plantation. And back before this fungus, which is called TR4, it's a Fusarium oxysporum. Before that fungus, that was one of the tourist activities of the big growers like Dole and Chiquita. You know, you could go to banana plantations and get a tour of the plantation. You can't do that anymore because of they're so terrified of this fungus. They don't have it in Costa Rica, but it's just about everywhere else. And so they're just waiting for it 
to make an incursion. So anyway, so I did get to go to the banana plantation and it was, yeah, it's astounding. Uh, the amount of personal care, just about every single banana that you eat gets. Um, it's, so it involves a lot of workers. Um, they, you know, so bananas are, they're just a big herb. So they just, they are annuals, basically. They grow, they'll make their flower and then they produce the bunches, which are like, you know, your, the bananas that you eat are just like, you know, banana hands that um, go up this 60 pound, like um, bunch of bananas. And uh, so since they're layered on top of each other, they just have to make sure that the bananas don't scratch each other. They have to make sure that there are no insects that make any, you know, uh, get into the bananas and discolor them or any, anyway. So they, they put, they bag all of the bananas, first of all, they put plastic bags around them. And in a conventional uh, banana plantation, they treat the inside of the bag with insecticide. So like, a, and um, I'm not gonna say which it is cause I'm not completely sure I have a good idea but I don't wanna say the wrong one. So they, they treat it with the pesticide. At Earth, they're doing um, sustainably grown bananas. So they treat it with the garlic kind of, um, organic pesticide. Oh yeah, you said the smell of that. That sounded yeah. like it was very powerful. <laughs> yeah, so that that works to keep the insects away. And then they put um, uh, pieces of cardboard in between every single banana hand that's sort of hanging down. And so um, out in the field, there are people just constantly like working with the bananas to make sure that nothing happens to them. And then they, once they're picked, um, there's just a whole, there's, you know, they sort through them all and they just pick out the ones that are perfect and those are the ones that get shipped. Um, and the thing is with the bananas that we eat, the Cavendish, they're more, they need more babying. So the bananas that used to be grown up until the 50s and 60s, and which partly contributed why bananas are so, um, so became such popular fruit was that they used to be able to just cut the bananas, you know, the big bunches off and throw them on a ship and they would ripen on the ship. They would, and they were hardy and they didn't need all this babying. And so they were a really easy fruit to kind of grow and throw on a ship. And that when the um, fusarium got to that, that was called TR1. Um, then they went to the Cavendish and one of the problems with the Cavendish is that it needed to be babied. And so they do that, they baby our bananas. Um, we should probably be paying a lot more for them than we do. Yeah, I mean, it, and it just makes you realize, like, you know, I, I do try to think about where food comes from and, you know, you think about pesticides and that kind of thing, but I did not, I mean, that was really wild. I did not realize, like, the extent of what goes into that. Well, I mean, yeah. And, oh, yeah. Well, I was just going to say, when you mentioned pesticides, I mean, even in a sustainably grown, so these ones grown in Costa Rica that are sold as sustainably grown, you can get them in Whole Foods. Um, they are still treated because of flax, another fungus called black cigatoka. So that's one that they really can't get away not treating. There's very few places that can grow fully organic bananas. They need to be much drier than like Costa Rica does. Oh, that's interesting. Well, I thought we could move a, a little bit just to animals because I realized we've talked, we're running out of time. We've talked about humans, we've talked about plants and trees, but there's like a whole another aspect to the book, which I think is like very, also very poignant, but sort of like the effects of different fungal pathogens on animals. And um, once again, it seems to come back to humans and how we move animals across the world. So can you talk a little bit about Maybe you want to tell us what brought you to the animal part. It sounds like you had bats that you yeah. that you got to appreciate. <laughs> yeah. So I will say, like when Tom was showing, um, you know, the pet store that she could go to. I mean, yes. you know, there was that time when they were, you know, just think of the animals and where they were getting them from the colonies and bring them. Now I look at these things and I just think, oh, there's some disease spreaders. I mean, you know, um, so yeah, so we had so the the, one of the other reasons why I was, you know, wanting to write about fungus was that uh, we we all we had a pretty sort of close experience with the white nose syndrome, which is the um, it's Pseudogymnoascus destructans, which is the fungus that gets kills bats and it kills little brown bats. And if anybody, I don't know, I'm sure you've all, uh, if you if you have bats in your neighborhood, you might have seen them decline over the years. And so this was back in. 
um, I think it was like the 2009 or something like that. We used to go, we had a church full of bats. Um, we, the whole, the neighborhood would, you know, go out at twilight in the summer and you could just watch these bats stream out of the church. Um, it was like those places in Austin where people like to go, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't yeah, as big as the, totally yeah, the bridge. As big as those bats, you know, over that, um, cool. over the lake, but you know, it was just an event. You just go and watch the bats stream out. And then, you know, we kind of noticed that over a few years they were disappearing and uh, there weren't that many bats coming out of the church at all within the course of a few years. And so people blame the church and they said, oh, they must have kicked them out of the church or they, you know, put barriers up or whatever. And then, you know, in the news a couple of years later, we were, were hearing about this fungus that was kill killing off the bats. And so um, I spoke to several scientists who worked with that white nose uh, disease. And the really sad thing is that, same with frogs, is that I spoke with these scientists who are my age, so probably 50s, 60s, who started their career thinking that they were gonna study the ecology of these animals. Like there's, you know, one guy who was just gonna, you know, he loved the bats, he's gonna study the bats and find out, you know, what they do and how they help farmers and all these great things. And he ended up, you know, studying white nose and, you know, monitoring dead bats instead. Same thing with frogs, Karen Lips, you know, thought when she went to Costa Rica and then Panama thinking she was going to discover all these cool frogs and write a dissertation on some new frog that she discovered. Instead, she ended up documenting the decline of frogs um, in Central I love to see how they turned that though into like a call to say that it's like I, I there's something you wrote about where it's not ethical to just study these creatures declining but that you have to actually do something about it right like <laughs> yeah and she actually did so um yeah. I wrote my current lips and the decline of the frogs and bd that um uh is the fungus that has, it's a chytrid fungus and it's been killing frogs around the world and uh, there's a cousin of that fungus called B-cell that kills salamanders. And so Karen Lips, who's in Maryland, um, you know, she had, she and other scientists have been documenting the decline of the frogs. And when they heard about B-cell, um, what we have here in the US and particularly in the uh, Appalachian Mountains uh, um, range is uh, really high and in interesting diversity in salamanders. And so, we do not have bee cell here yet. It was in Europe. It killed um, their salamanders called fire salamanders. And so what Karen and uh, other conservation biologists and the Fish and Wildlife did was all work together to develop a plan to keep bee cell out of the states. And they actually did that. So she originally tried to do it with BD. She tried to have some kind of trait. So this is where I get a little tripped up. But so Megan is our a national mycologist for plants and plant diseases, there's no equivalent for animals. And this is like, there's, there's nobody that specifically is looking out for fungal infections or really any kind of infection in animals that are traded. Uh, not animals for food, that's different. They, they have, um, there's more regulation and um, monitoring, but for, for the pet trade, it's, there's not a whole lot of regulation or monitoring. And so that's how these diseases come in. And so that's how BD spread around the world. And so when the B cell came to Europe, Karen and this, these other scientists and policymakers said, we're gonna try to keep it out. So we need to work with the animal trade and figure out how we can stop B cell from coming here. And when they tried it with BD, Fish and Wildlife was like, well, you already have BD here. So you can't keep it out. So we can't do anything. Um, they had put a lot of work. And so they, years later when B-cell came along, they redirected their efforts. And there is now a ban on, this isn't what they wanted. They actually wanted sort of more like a health certificate that the, the any salamanders coming into the US would be declared free of disease. Um, but instead what they got was a ban of 201 different salamander species that are known to carry the chytrid fungus um, and so could be carriers and bring it in here. So that though was a success and it's been uh, several years so far and we haven't had uh, B-cell detected yet. And the um, USGS has done a huge monitoring program of salamanders and they haven't found it here yet. So that's a success story. It's really, yeah, that was very cool. Like, and in a really neat way to, I don't know, to, I feel like it's easy in science to, 
get into your own niche and like lose touch with what's happening in the world. And this is such a story of using your knowledge to really make a huge difference. It was very cool, I thought. Um, another interesting thing is, it, it sounds like it, like the reptiles, not that surprising, but the bats are a mammal. So what's yeah. up with that? <laughs> well, so that goes back to the temperature thing. So bats, you know, warm temperature, they're even warmer than us uh, because they fly and they have really high body temperatures, but they hibernate. So BD um, impacts hibernating bats. Those that don't hibernate uh, don't seem to be so impacted by BD. So the thought is while they're hibernating, their temperatures drop to match those of the cave temperatures. So up here, that can be like four degrees C. So they can get really low body temperatures. Everything slows down, metabolism, breathing, and probably their immune system. And so the fungus can grow on the bats. Um, and that's, what, that's why the bats are susceptible. Um, so the funny thing, I gave a book talk the other night and the same question my son asked the minute I said it's that about bats is, well, what about bears <laughs> or other hibernating? Oh, yeah. That's a really good question. Um, hmm. So there was an evolutionary biologist in that group and he, his thought was that bears are solitary. So you don't have, you know, thousands of them crammed into a place where fungus can spread from bear to bear. Single bear dies, you wouldn't know it. Um, I have read there's other things like one of the bats um, are kind of, they, they are living on the metabolic edge. So they're so small, um, they have to eat a lot. So when they're hibernating, they don't really have much, they don't have fat to spare, you know? And one of the thoughts is of how the fungus kills the bats is that it's waking them up or causing them somehow to sort of use more energy while they're hibernating. And then they die in the spring when it's time well, to come definitely. up. I thought that was very interesting. The question of why, because it seems like they have their torpor, their torpor is, is interrupted. And I was very curious about whether that was like cause or effect because like you could, or, or exactly how it would work because, you know, sleep states, eat, our, our temperature drops a lot when, when we're asleep. Um, and pretty much everything when it's asleep, the, the temperature drops. So is it, is it that I was wondering like, not that we can answer these questions, but like, is it, is the bat, does it need to wake up to try to raise its temperature to try to fight off the fungus, you know, or yeah. is the fungus itself somehow, you know, waking up what, what's up? I don't know, but I thought it was really, that was very, very interesting. And it was yeah. interesting, too, the, the idea that the, these bats are now being selected for bats with obesity genes, yes. the fat well, bats. I don't know if they call it obesity genes, but they do call it the fat bat study, but they are yeah. they're genes that are, there's been, um, I think three genes that have been identified that um, one is with metabolism, um, one is with behavior. So maybe they go in and hibernate a slightly different time. These are bats that, so scientists have done, they found that uh, some bat scientists have found that there are bats that are surviving white nose and they're trying to figure out if they have some sort of evolutionary rescue. And what, they're, what they've found is that yes, the bats seem to be heavier or those bats that are heavier when they go to hibernate are the ones that seem to be surviving. And that there does seem to be some um, genetic um, differences, um, gene frequency differences between the bats that are surviving and those that aren't. So. Um, and those genes, as far as they can identify the role of those genes, it seems to be um, in yeah, metabolism or behavior or something that would maybe give them that advantage to um, putting on more weight before they hibernate. Well, I guess I was worried reading about that. Are we the next to get white nose? But I don't think we're going to because it seems like we are very good at feeding ourselves. <laughs> yeah, but another thing that Arturo, who uh, I think it was his study, is that he, our body temperature seems to be slowly going down. Have you read about that? That's pretty interesting. The human body temperature yeah. is dropping. Wow. That's really interesting. Huh. Yeah. So there's that. Well, this was terrific. I know we're hitting the time and let's see, I'm, I saw there's some comments in the chat. I can't tell if there are any specific questions that I, that I missed. I think Elizabeth, you had a question about yum chestnuts. Do you want to ask that? Yeah, do you know, you were talking about the the monoculture, you know, the, the fact that the bananas are cloned, and I was wondering, 
you know, the folks who are working on genetically modifying the chestnuts, do they have a good sort of seed bank yes. for genetic diversity? Um, that is an excellent question. So I'm going to say I think they do because they also have to think about um, sort of where they're growing and you know at which uh, latitude that they're growing at and sort of the conditions there so and i that actually when they do the pine the white the pine tree breeding they're breeding white bark pine out in the west coast they're breeding a couple of different pines to resist uh pine um, pine blister rust and one of the things they're intentionally doing is ensuring that those that they breed are diverse um have genetic diversity and that they're also bred to be in different parts of the um, West. So whether it's drier or cooler or higher latitude or whatever. Um, so I would guess that they have thought about that just because they've thought about a lot of stuff with the American Chestnut Foundation. That's a great question though, Elizabeth. That, that, yeah, that, I think that was, yeah. that's a very good point. Um, Oh, one interesting thing about chestnuts that I think from a mushroom perspective is like, are there a lot of mushrooms that were mycorrhizal with chestnuts that we just aren't seeing? Um, and that is something that is interesting to me. Example, there's an Amanita species that was described, I think by Coker, um, and it was called Amanita guineana, or, uh, I don't know if I could be saying it wrong, but it was described from North Carolina in association with American chestnut at very high elevations, yeah. like, um, and it's one of, so it's one of the destroying angel species, like, uh, from Amanita section, uh, phylloides, so one of the white, uh, you know, amatoxin containing, uh, Amanita species, and actually one of my myco, myco pals, um, found this, a possible candidate for this mushroom in association with like a tiny chestnut in a mountain in Virginia or West Virginia. And when he found it, it's, I don't know if it's been sequenced and I don't know if the type was ever sequenced, but it, it raised to me this like question mark of, you know, how many of, how many mushrooms are lost when a tree is lost. And I think that's something you talk about in your book, all the downstream effects when you lose when you lose bats, you know, insects yeah. aren't getting eaten and, you know, and so on, but the ripple effects. So I oh, love yeah. it. I, I thought it was just a tremendous book. I really enjoyed reading it and it, I really appreciate you, you know, coming to talk to us. And I just want to really say that this is not, this is not a mycophobic book. So, you know, <laughs> but it's a, it's a scary cover, but, and it's a cool cover, but don't judge the book by its cover. Cause I really think the book is like really, to me, it's a really book about ecology and, you know, as much as anything else and about like human sociology and how do we respond to these things. And it, it, I mean, it left me with a ton of questions, but I think, um, yeah, I, so I know that a lot of the interviews, people are like asking you about, you know, the next pandemic and how are we all going to die because of mushrooms and, or fungi. But I, I thought you really did a nuanced job of kind of capturing the complex kind of webs and how they're getting disrupted. So thank you so much. Um, oh. Appreciate having you, yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me here. And yeah. Come down and visit me. I, it's still open. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. I'm so sorry you haven't gotten your book yet. That's, <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Um, but we, well, owe yeah, you a, we owe you a trip to the fungus collections. Yeah. When you I, when you all read the book, which I know you will, you'll read that one of the stars of the book is Megan Romberg, which I know I've already said, but is very exciting. Um, so it it's really just a, a great example. I think that, you know, our club is very different from other clubs in the sense, like partially just the luck of where we are in a big city, but also being, you know, so close to the USDA, but that we have as our scientific advisor, like the one person who is like protecting our plants from. It's a team. There's, there's more than me. <laughs> well, I know, but, but, but anyway, so it's, it's really cool. Um, it's a lucky thing about our club and yeah, we would love to have you, um, anytime you want to come down and visit Megan, we'll take you on a foray and you should, you should look up the Boston uh, Mycological Club. It's actually great people in that club too. Okay. Yeah, I will do. But I, thank you so much for having me. I mean, this has just been, uh, and I love the presentation and I love the, um, 
the part where you're talking about identification of, you know, which is which. Oh, cool. Well, so, yeah. yeah. Well, we're all our meetings are open, so they're all on our YouTube <laughs> channel, and you're welcome to tune in anytime. And we'd love to get you hooked on mushrooms. You know, uh, we we think they're really cool. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you everybody for tuning in and uh, we'll see you at Sequinota and then uh, the first Tuesday in September. Yeah. See you there. Night. Night. Bye.